if we are to have a greater background on the metabolism of drugs, I think it would be necessary to cover the more chemical aspects of that. So previously, I just mentioned that there are many intentions for doing metabolism, though most of the time it is really just to deactivate uh, parent drugs, which we don't need anymore. But aside from that, we cannot live all our pharmacy lives just thinking of these arrows and just saying, ah, all right, we have the parent drug, it will become something else. And then it's either they're going to be working, they're going to get, get out of our body. We also need to kind of know, delve a little deeper into this process. And that's what got us to this. Okay. So first of all, we have to take note that the chemical processes or reactions that are done to metabolize drugs can be divided into two what we can call phases. Those are phase one and phase two. And phase one is actually the entire left portion here. And then phase two are the processes tabulated right here. So the most common name of phase one reactions are functionalization reactions. We'll have actual examples later. And then phase two is often called conjugation reactions. And since if I draw the molecules, it actually becomes quite complicated or too large. Um, I just tabulated it here. Okay. Now, despite this, you might think one and two. So is it named phase one? Because it's always going to happen like that. Um, I think it's nice for me to very early on reinforce this idea that it's not called phase one because it's the first thing that will always happen. No. In fact, I, I, I believe that phase one and two should have been named other ways because, yeah, that's, that's, that was also my assumption before. But no, you don't need to go through phase one to go through phase two. Sometimes uh, drug molecules can go through phase two before they go to phase one. Some drug molecules may, in fact, just go through phase one. Some of them will just go to phase two. So there are many different possibilities. And for you to know some of those specifics, you really do have to study in the individual drugs. But that's, of course, not what we want to do here. So here, the most common intention of phase one reactions is to have a functional group kind of revealed from the originally um, or from the original parent drug. Okay, So that is suggesting that our active parent molecules are not usually ready to be metabolized because there's no part in their structure that is willing to be converted into something else. So in that case, uh, phase one reactions force the drug molecule to have some kind of group which serves as a point of attachment for, well, again, I said it's not always uh, required, but most of the time we prepare um, molecules in phase one to be uh, subjected to phase two reactions. Now, phase two are called conjugation reactions because they intend to conjugate or add some kind of molecule to that uh, original parent. Okay, So that means that we want to add this orange thing to our drug right here. And so the result would be a conjugate of something that is the drug with whatever you add. In. Okay. Now we're going to discuss phase one a little more in detail and then phase two later. So what? Phase one is functionalization. There are three main reactions in functionalization reactions. Those include oxidation, reduction, and hydrolysis. And again, um, we'll be having examples of them below. The intention is to force our original molecule into having some kind of functional group that is either easier to excrete or easier to conjugate something with. It, most of the time, it's actually an OH group. Okay, So oxidation is the same oxidation that we have been discussing back then. Well, if you watched my organic chemistry videos. And that will lead to the formation of hydroxyl groups. Okay, So most of the time, oxida uh, oxidation enzymes in our body will result to converting a certain compound into the same thing, but with just one extra hydroxyl group. So in this case, we have lordazepam. Okay? In, in the body, it can be oxidized so that it could have a specific OH group here. 
Okay. Of course, you, de- you do need to discuss deeper uh, chemistry of this to know that it's going to go in this actual part of the molecule. I'm just showing it here as a random example. Just to get the point across, we add OH groups, usually when we do oxidation. Now, you can also do oxidative removal, which is you're not just going to add... Um, OH groups nonchalantly or just you know out of the blue, but you're actually revealing OH groups as a result of another process. For example, if you have amphetamine, you will notice that the only a significant functional group here is an amino group. Our body, okay, or researchers have shown that our body, the human body, has the tendency to remove this amino group removal, but in its place will be a keto group or a carbonyl group converting it into something called phenyl acetone. So you remove something at the same time, you added an oxygen, in this case, double bond O. Okay? And again, OH groups have really great um, a, uh, attraction for things that we attach during phase two. That's why oxidation is a very big deal. In fact, it's so popular, it's so important, it's so frequent in drugs that we need to remember the name of the enzymes that do oxidation in our body, primarily the liver. Those would involve enzymes of the cytochrome P450 system, or you just abbreviate it as CYP450. And it is so important that we even have to consider the different um, the different subtypes of uh, CYP. So sometimes if you do read a little more on uh, individual drugs, they can be said to be metabolized via CYP. 3A4 or 1A2 or 2C9. And these are just code names, really. I, I think for pharma level, we don't need to decipher every single letter or number here, but uh, these are very common CYP isoforms or subtypes that metabolize specific drugs. Of course, you will only get to be familiar with these CYP isoforms if you do study more drugs along the way. Okay. Now, there are some rare cases, and I'm saying rare because compared to oxidation, this is extremely uh, less frequent. Reduction can, you know, happen. Okay, so for example, this is a this is a demonstration of that. In some drugs which have nitro groups, they could be reduced to form amino groups. So going back to our definitions, if you remove oxygen atoms or add hydrogen atoms or uh, do both meaning remove oxygen and, and place hydrogen as replacement, that is defined as reduction. So, you know, there are not a lot of drugs with nitro groups and therefore this is not frequently encountered, but it does get mentioned every once in a while. Also, for some drugs which have thiol groups, okay, um, they can be converted into disulfides. And this is actually a mixture of both reduction and oxidation. If you want to convert thiols into disulfides, if you uh, already have some biochemistry background, remember two cysteines becoming a cysteine molecule. That is the process of oxidation. Or if you want to break the disulfide into two separate thiol groups, that comes as reduction. And uh, again, there are you know not all drugs that we take and have sulfur atoms in them. But if there are, then these processes might happen, which are still under phase one. Another, of course, is hydrolysis, which is the act of using water to break down carboxylic acid derivatives. And this applies for uh, two major functional groups, esters and amides, which for multiple reasons, many of the popular drugs that we can find in the shelves in drugstores have ester or amide functionalities in them. For example, something as popular as aspirin is an R, uh, RCOOR, it's an ester. So knowing that it is an ester, then it is actually susceptible to hydrolysis. And in our body, this does happen, uh, giving rise to salicylic acid and acetic acid, wherein this hydrolysis product is actually responsible for giving a lot of the effects we expect from aspirin, like pain relief. So those are the phase one reactions. Just three, remember guys, just three. Oxidation, reduction and hydrolysis. In fact, if you are fond of grouping these two as one, just call them redox. That's just two processes, redox and hydrolysis. Now, phase two, again, as I've mentioned uh, a while ago, are conjugation reactions. The intention is to add a specific molecule to 
a drug. Okay, it could be the parent or, or a metabolite that has undergone phase one. And then whatever that thing that you added, um, uh, whatever is that thing that you added, hopefully it will assist the molecule in getting it out of the body. And these are some of the most popular processes under conjugation or phase two reactions. We have glucuronidation, acetylation, sulfation, methylation, and uh, glutathione conjugation. Okay. Um, I also assume that many of our watchers are familiar that GSH is the uh, abbreviation for glutathione. Um, of course, if we mentioned the uh, enzyme for oxidation, which include the CYP450 enzymes, it is also necessary for me to mention the enzymes that perform conjugation. Luckily, if you memorize the processes, the enzymes would come almost naturally. Look at this, leucoronidation, okay? Um, has the enzyme UDP glucuronosyl acyl transferase. Or uh, if, if it's still too long for you, it can be abbreviated as UDPGAT. Sometimes they even drop the A, they just call it UGP, UDPGT. Okay? Now, it's long, but the fact that it has glucuronosyl in its name makes it so easy to remember. Just like here also, acetylation is done by N-acetyltransferases. It has the word acetyl there. Sulfation is done by sulfotransferases. Methylation is done by methyltransferases. And glutathione conjugation is done by glutathione S transferases. Easy enough? In fact, that if it's not, uh, it's not enough that we know the enzyme, okay, but no need to fear because the cofactor or, well, the cofactor is the source of whatever we add, okay, also bears the name of the process. Glucuronidation literally means you add a glucuronic acid. So that means your cofactor must also have that in the name. Acetylation means you need to add an acetyl group to something using this enzyme. And where do we get the acetyl group? The cofactor acetyl-CoA. Oh, biochemistry uses this a lot, right? Sulfation, where do we get the sulfate group that sulfotransferase will be giving to our drug? It will come from something called 3 prime phosphoadenosyl 3 prime phosphosulfate of course it can be abbreviated and the abbreviation is phosphoadenosyl phosphosulfate paps okay methylation okay we have uh, usually s adenosyl methionine or sam or sam or sometimes it's also abbreviated as or shortcutted as adomet as the main cofactor and of course for glutathione conjugation what else glutathione now, since we have this talk about enzymes, you might ask, so what are the name of the enzymes for reduction in hydrolysis? Because I haven't mentioned it and I just realized it now. Well, we just call them in general as reductases. Okay? We usually don't have like very popular examples of reductases for drug metabolism because, again, this is relatively rare. For, hydroly for hydrolysis, then we have hydrolases. If we have esters, we have esterases. If we have amides, we have amidases. And really, we would just be talking about a specific esterase or amidase once you encounter a certain ester or amide drug. So it's generalities right now. Okay. Now, it would not end okay, without me mentioning some notable drugs because, of course, um, you might wonder, why is there a need to have many types of conjugation reactions? Can we just have one type of phase two reaction for every single drug? Of course, that is impossible for multiple reasons. Like, for example, not all the time you can have the same functional group. Um, or you can have the same uh, uh, phase two reaction because we have different functional groups that might not respond to just one process. So you might need different processes for different functional groups. Okay, and of course, that means that we have different types of processes, we can have different implications as well. Okay, for example, glucuronidation and sulfation are the two most common phase two reactions, wherein they're really, really, their only goal is to get our drugs out of the body, to inactivate them, and to finally make them more polar and therefore make them easier to excrete. Additionally, glucuronidation is uh, the, the, uh, the, the reaction that happens with chloramphenicol, which I would already give everyone the warning. Chloramphenicol is not as commonly given and taken as it was given a few decades ago, but it is very commonly mentioned that chloramphenicol can cause blood problems. 
especially in babies because babies have uh, delayed development of glucuronidation. So basically, uh, I'm trying to say that everyone knows that you're not supposed to give chloramphenicol to babies. Well, in the first place, it's not commonly given to everyone in the modern day anyway. Acetylation is relatively rare. And it, in fact, is so rare, we have a mnemonic for the only drugs that are acetylated. Okay, we have hydralazine, isoniazid, procainamide, and sulfonamides, or HIPS, H-I-P-S. Hydralazine um, is uh, an antihypertensive. Isoniazid is a drug for tuberculosis. Procainamide is an antiarrhythmic. It deals with irregular heartbeats. Sulfonamides are a class of antibiotics. Okay, and the thing with acetylation is that depending on your genetics, depending on your race, okay, and this is due to facts, okay, we have what we call fast and slow acetylators, okay? Usually, the fast acetylators are those that are found in the eastern part of the globe, including Asians. So, for example, I'm a Filipino, I'm an Asian. I could, uh, well, of course, I haven't checked my, I haven't had my specific gene for acetylation um, because it might be expensive here, but you know, I could assume that because I'm Asian, I could be a fast acetylator. And meaning I would have no problem metabolizing a drug like isoniazid for TB. But if I am a slow acetylator, and usually this would involve Caucasians, Americans, Europeans, then that may pose a problem because if you don't get rid of isoniazid quickly or any of these other drugs, it may accumulate. And we know that if the dose is very high, it could become toxic. And so this now falls under what we call as pharmacogenomics. So there's this other branch of pharmaceutical sciences wherein we try to assess which genetic factors may be relevant in the clinical setting. And of the phase two reactions, acetylation is the most pharmacogenomically relevant. Now, methylation is not a common method for getting rid of drug molecules. In fact, methylation is not really that common for drugs in general. In fact, when methylation is discussed, it's more commonly for the purpose of showing how some neurotransmitters are synthesized. For example, norepinephrine, a very popular neurotransmitter, which uh, can control functions like blood pressure and even mood. Okay. Well, mood uh, kind of outdated, but um, before it used to be uh, uh, assumed to be a major player in controlling mood and other things can be converted into another popular neurotransmitter and hormone called epinephrine. Mm -hmm. And it is a methyl transferase that can do that simply because the only difference between epinephrine and norepinephrine is that epinephrine has an extra methyl group. Who will give the methyl group? What else? A methyl transferase. And then glutathione conjugation is very important because it plays a role in metabolizing one of the most popular drugs that exist in the modern day, paracetamol. You see, paracetamol is normally oxidized into a metabolite called NAPQI or NAPQI. And under normal circumstances, the amount of NAPQI would be low enough such that it will not harm the body. But researches of the last many, many decades have shown that if NAPQI does accidentally increase in number in the body, it can cause damage to the liver. And some people could actually be hospitalized and worst case, even die because of this liver failure due to paracetamol, something that we could, you know, we probably buy just like candies in the drugstore. Okay. That's why if that accidentally happens, we need to bank on the power of glutathione to detoxify our paracetamol overdose. And in fact, the antidote to paracetamol um, toxicity, as you will learn in the future, as if you are a pharmacy major, is something that will contribute to the empowerment and regeneration of the glutathione that is already inside your body. And of course, there are more examples. You will learn more about them when you go to individual drugs along the way.